try to maximize uh, everybody's time. Um, but it, the option would be yours if you wanted to wait. But as soon as we get a quorum, I'll interrupt and establish it. Sure. Um, Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, members here, we're going to start as a subcommittee. Um, we're going to do a little bit out of order. We're going to go to file item number four, um, Senator Padilla's uh, SB 778. It is alcoholic beverage license contest and sweepstakes. Again, as soon as we get the form established, we'll interrupt and do that, and then we'll, we'll come right back. Uh, Senator, you're up. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the, the flexibility. Uh, Senate Natural Resources meeting concurrently, so I'll be doing a little back and forth with that committee and, and come back for uh, votes uh, when the time is right. Uh, SB 778, I'll first explain what it does, and then I'll give some of the history and background as to why I've introduced the bill. But uh, this bill would authorize, once again, uh, for alcohol beverage manufacturers who are authorized licensees of the California Alcoholic Beverage Control to conduct uh, consumer contests within California. Uh, the analysis before you is uh, written uh, as the bill is proposed to be amended, so I'll present the bill uh, reflecting the amendments that uh, we've discussed with the committee and stakeholders. The bill would establish conditions for conducting consumer marketing contests for those eligible manufacturers. Uh, the bill uh, specifically would prohibit the awarding of points uh, or likelihood of winning these uh, contests based on consumption to consumers that can be redeemed for prizes. I think this directly and more than anything else addresses uh, historic concerns with sweepstakes in California. Uh, the bill would prohibit the awarding of alcohol beverages specifically as a prize. The bill would not obligate a wholesaler or distributor uh, to contribute to the costs for any contest. That's addressing a concern of a couple of the other tiers in our three-tier system in just California. Me, just a second. I think now, we amended January 5th, so I think that the analysis in the bill in print might actually be up to date. Okay. If that's the case, then even better. Okay. Uh, want to acknowledge that the bill would prohibit any contest to promote a single retail licensee. These are more general uh, contests and sweepstakes focused on the consumer. Uh, the bill would prohibit conditioning of product placements or sale of the contest product as a condition of advertising. Uh, Current law uh, limits the amount or the value of a prize uh, to uh, whether it's beer, wine, or spirits to only a couple of dollars. Um, and I'll, I'll let the witnesses that are here give examples of some of the contests and sweepstakes that are currently being conducted by California alcohol manufacturers to everybody in the country except for California residents. So I think I need to underscore these are contests and sweepstakes that are already taking place prize winners being anybody but a California resident, including uh, contests and sweepstakes being sponsored by California's very own businesses. In fact, contests and sweepstakes like this were uh, allowed under law from 1988 through 1997. And it was in 1997 that the Department of Alcohol Beverage Control felt that the consumer marketing contests uh, became a direct inducement to purchase and consume alcohol because of the way the prizes and awards were structured, be it points or purchases. Uh, there's been previous legislative attempts to restore contests and sweepstakes uh, to California law, all unsuccessful, clearly. That's why we're here today. But I think for the first time, uh, we have a bill that addresses the specific concerns that drove some advocates and the ABC uh, to uh, limit and, and, and prohibit such contests and sweepstakes back in 1997. The bill before you has uh, a tremendous uh, input, not just from ABC, uh, but also the public safety community. I'll let them testify as to their views as well, in addition to industry licensees across uh, the product spectrum from beer, wine, and spirits. Uh, here in support uh, today are Mike Falasco of the Wine Institute, the bill sponsor, along with Margie Healy of Corbell, and Deborah Doman from the Treasury Wine Estates. At uh, the appropriate time, I'd uh, ask for your eye vote. Mr. Chair and committee members, uh, Mike Falasco, Wine Institute. Um, 
Senator Perdita did an excellent job summarizing the bill's uh, intent, the work that's been done to get the bill in the form it is today. And in the interest of time, I'm going to turn it over to um, uh, our two winery representatives. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and committee members. My name is Margie Healy with Corval Champagne Cellars. As the Senator mentioned, um, currently uh, sweepstakes and contests are allowed in 49 other states and there has been no evidence of abuse uh, among sweepstakes and contests um, being held in those states. Uh, you might want to ask yourself why now, after 15 years, would um, we want to put this practice back into play here in California? Well, we believe that social media has opened the door for wineries of all sizes to participate in sweepstakes and contests. We have a listing, and I believe it's in the packet of contests and sweepstakes that have been held. But if you take a look at that list, most of those are of larger wineries. Um, you know, you've got Barefoot Wine and Bubbly, uh, hosted Jake Owen sweepstakes, Corbell does a girls getaway sweepstakes. But when you take a look at social media, small wineries um, can have, you know, a recipe contest and, and the prize can be a cookbook. So something on a much smaller level with a much smaller budget. And so that's why we would like to incorporate um, these being allowed in California. Uh, if you take a look at the uh, language we have put into place safeguards that we believe will um, protect consumers in that participation cannot be uh, conditioned on purchase, uh, wholesalers and retailers may not participate, um, and also if California laws are broken, there is a fine of $10,000 and also the ABC can uh, say that a winery cannot do a sweepstakes or contest for up to 12 months. Okay. Uh, increasingly, sweepstakes and contests have been a, uh, a tool in the marketing kit for all businesses at, outside of alcohol industry, um, and an important way to connect with our consumers as California is our largest market. There has been some negative uh, backlash from our consumers in California as they don't understand why they can't participate, but residents in 49 other states can. Um, and really banning sweet states in California has resulted in a loss in California tourism and loss in marketing opportunities for California and California wines. Um, Increasingly, our, the sweepstakes and contest prizes are tied to larger regional wine education or um, uh, ed tourism and education activities. Uh, and there is really, there's no better way to connect with our consumers than to have them come to our market and connect with our, uh, with our local wine tourism area. Um, in Napa specifically, where we have our flagship brand, Behringer Wine Estates, um, nearly half of our visitors uh, to Napa come from residents within California. So banning them and unable for us to use the tool to drive uh, consumers to our, to our destinations dramatically hurt us. And really the California wine industry as a whole needs every single uh, tool it has in its marketing to sell wine. In 2000, California represented 69.3% of the total wine sold in the United States. In 2010, that number has decreased to 60.2%, and there has been some analysis that it expected to decline to 51.7% by 2020. So we really do need every single tool in our marketing kit to connect with our consumers. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. Steve Cruz on behalf of the Family Winemakers of California. Uh, we represent over 500 of the smaller wineries and vineyards in California, and we're proud to be co-sponsors of SB 778. As uh, Senator Padilla uh, and the previous witnesses testified, um, um, stating the, the, the benefits of, of sweepstakes in, in California, we support those reasons, but from the small producer perspective, I just simply wanted to add they are especially beneficial uh, with small wineries with limited budgets um, of building um, brand awareness uh, and loyalty uh, with customers. Uh, it's particularly true in California's competitive market. Um, and again, with the safeguards in place, both with the input from ABC and the public safety community, uh, we think that uh, this preserves the state's uh, laws with respect to, to alcohol and regulations on, on sweepstakes and marketing. Give me just uh, for a these second. reasons, we urge your support. Oh, oh, uh, call the roll. Right. Here. Right present, Anderson. Here. Anderson present, Berryhill. Here. Berryhill here. Calderon, Canella, Corbett. De Leon, 
De Leon present. Evans? Hernandez? Here. Hernandez present. Padilla? Here. Padilla present. Strickland? Wyland? Yee. Yee present. Okay, we've got a quorum. Let's keep going. Sorry about that, but. No, I've concluded my remarks. Thank you, okay. sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, Gavin McHugh, on behalf of the Distilled Spirits Council, for all the reasons stated, we strongly support this uh, very positive legislation for California. Thank you. Okay. Other witnesses in support? Let me say, I guess, you know, as an as a old GO person, I mean, just, I mean, we spent like a few years ago battling about champagne and whether or not Corbell is a champagne or a sparkling wine. Um, the, 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 the French actually have a guy that comes here sometimes and argues about that. I mean, that's not the subject of the bill, but I can tell you, those of us in California, we've had that battle a bit, and um, it, it will ultimately be a battle that we'll lose because most people in the world get incensed when you say California champagne because they say there's no such thing. And so I, I, I throw that out as your business, handle it how you will. but. Uh, we have tried as a policy not to do that, but because um, we do try to sell California wine in Europe. And the last thing we want to do is end up in a trade war with the EU and other countries about what we call our wine. So I, I, I mentioned that, as you said it, and your card is printed that way. But uh, it is a losing battle that we'll have if we end up in a trade war with the Europeans over what we call the wine. Are there further witnesses in support? Witnesses in opposition? Mr. Chair, Senators, Happy New Year. Fred Jones, representing the California Council on Alcohol Problems. Um, primarily, we have a concern about the process. Um, why we're choosing to gut and amend a two-year bill, which has a three-week deadline to get out of the House of Origin. Uh, we're dealing with an imprint bill, but now we're dealing with a mock-up. I believe that there are some industry interests that want to further amend this bill. No, we're, we're, right now that we're dealing with an imprint bill. Okay. Uh, my now, point it, is... It, it might be amended at some point, but today the bill that's in print is the bill that we're voting on. So it's, it's current what we're voting on. Okay, we'll see if it's current next week. I'm not well, a betting man, as you know, Senator, but no, that, I bet you it won't be. <laughs> but, but, but amendments are the nature of what we do. So it could have been amended even if it were in print for a year and a half. I mean, it may have changed, but you're correct that it is a bill that was amended. It is current in its form. It, the um, uh, analysis that you see is the analysis for the bill as it would have been amended. We, we took the liberty of doing the amendments and staff actually did the amend the um, uh, the review on the bill uh, that was to be amended so we actually did that so that it wasn't quite something that was a mock-up because I had that same concern that you did so if it's further amendment amended may I assume this committee will ask for it back De depending on what they are if it substantially changes the bill we would do that yes okay I'm just on the process side of our complaint, okay. or concern, I should say. Um, the House of Origin is a really opportunity to, to really work out and vet issues. Right. And if we choose to use a gut and amend of a second year, two year bill, you're giving up a lot of those opportunities just because of the legislative process and deadlines. So but, but remember, Mr. we actually did the amendments and put the bill in print. So, I mean, I would disagree only in that those things that we would do in the House of Origin were done here. So we're, we're not forwarding something that to, is to be amended later. This is, you know, a, a product. Now, the assembly is another house, and they may take another swipe at it, but this is as complete as we could get it in this house, and I'm not sure, frankly, that the amendments that are being proposed are going to happen anyway, because those amendments that I've seen proposed would give me pause for the bill. So. You know, that, that notwithstanding, I, I share a concern that I would imagine you would, is that the contest is not one where, in order to win, you have to drink more. And so those amendments that I've seen that would foster having to drink more in order to win give me pause. And so they were, having seen that, it wasn't included and it would have probably changed 
uh, both the analysis and the outcome of this bill. Right, and I haven't had the luxury of seeing those proposed amendments. I'm just right. hearing right. That other interests are proposing amendments and I haven't seen it again. It goes to an issue of process. But yes, you're indeed correct. The concern we have obviously with sweepstakes is it encourages the purchase of alcoholic beverages to increase your uh, chances of winning. This is a complicated issue though, a legal issue. Mm. Uh, it's been litigated substantially here in California. In fact, it was appealed all the way to our state Supreme Court. They denied cert, but nevertheless, this is a complicated issue. And to be able to gut and amend it and have three days of a bill in print and move it out of its first policy committee and knowing that it's got to get out of the Senate in less than three weeks is troublesome for us. So on just the process side of it, we feel we have to oppose the bill. We prefer to have a full introduction, full hearing, have opportunities for amendments to be vetted in this committee, in this policy committee, and for that reason we oppose the bill. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there further opposition? What is the... I'd like to move the bill. The bill has been moved. Um, this is, um, again, SB 778. Uh, we do not have proposed amendments at this time. It is going to the assembly. They will look at it. Uh, if the amendments change the bill substantially, uh, we will look at those amendments and bring it back if necessary. Uh, but we're voting on a bill in print that is as complete as uh, we know it to be today. Secretary, call the roll. Motion is due pass and we refer to appropriations, right? Aye. Right, aye. Anderson? Aye. Anderson, aye. Berryhill? Aye. Berryhill, aye. Calderon? Canella? Corbett? Aye. Corbett, aye. De Leon? Aye. De Leon, aye. Evans? Hernandez? Aye. Hernandez, aye. Padilla? Aye. Padilla, aye. Strickland? Wyland? Ye. Aye. Ye, aye. We've got a couple of absent members. That's enough to get out, but we'll leave it on call. Thank you um, very much. Thank you. We've got um, one bill on consent. While several people are here, why don't I move uh, Madam Secretary, to the consent calendar, uh, call the roll on consent. How many items did we have? Uh, we only have one, item number one. Item number one, Senator Kehoe's SB1 is on consent. Uh, is there a motion on the consent calendar? Moved by Senator Corbett, call the roll on the consent calendar. Right. Aye. Right aye, Anderson. Aye. Anderson aye, Berryhill. Aye. Berryhill aye, Calderon. Canella, Corbett. Aye. Corbett aye, De Leon. De Leon I. Evans, Hernandez, aye. Hernandez I. Padilla, aye. Padilla I. Strickland, Wyland, Yi. Yi I. That's eight. Uh, that bill has enough to move. We'll leave it on call for the absent members. Uh, I see Senator Wolk in the audience. Senator Wolk, members, has SB 383, remote caller bingo. It has an urgency attachment. Uh, those here in favor of SB 383, if you would come forward at this time. Senator Wolk, you're up. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Mr. Chair and members. Um, remote caller bingo enables nonprofit charities to link several bingo games to a central location using video technology. The game has helped uh, veterans groups, churches, schools, and other charities raise much more funding compared to the traditional bingo. Remote caller bingo provides the largest payout to charities in the nation. 43% of the money raised in the game goes directly to charities. In the first three quarters of last year, charities raised over $180,000. Only nine locations statewide are playing the game but there are many more that would like to play, and that's what we're trying to facilitate. The Remote Caller Bringo program was enacted in 2009, regulated by the California Gaming Control Commission. However, few charities have been able to utilize the game due to the initial delay in development of regulations, followed by an excessive and cumbersome paperwork and permitting requirement to get the game up and running. Last May, the commission inform charities that only charities registered prior to July 1st of last year can play. No new charities can apply to play the game and that the remote caller bingo program will terminate in this June of 2012. It's not that there isn't a lack of interest. However, 
I'm not sure how many more hoops the state can make them jump through before they give up this lucrative fundraising tool. Initially, I thought the solution to this problem, and that's part of the reason this is a two-year bill, I thought the solution was to designate the Department of Justice as the new state entity to oversee the program. But upon further consideration, it seems that I'm reinventing the wheel of the same regulatory oversight. I apologize for the late notice to the committee, but given the accelerated pace of the two-year bill process, I've decided to amend the Department of Justice out of the bill. Instead, my bill will require the commission to utilize what we wanted to do with initially, a more streamlined and simplified regulatory approach that has been utilized to date. So instead of being licensed by the commission, the charities will register annually with the commission and continue to maintain local licensure and permitting requirements, as is the case with traditional bingo. The commission will be required to provide a registration form, maintain a registry on its website of, of participating charities, and require a charity's management company to self-report pertinent audit information to the commission in an effort to ensure the legitimacy of the game. As permitted under existing law, the Commission ha currently has the power to charge fees to cover registration costs. It can also charge a fee to audit a charity if it deems it's necessary. <coughs> DOJ and local government will still remain responsible for enforcement of the game, and the Commission will remain responsible as they are under law for regulation of the game, as has always been the case. I have witnesses here to testify in support of the measure, and I want to thank the chair and the vice chair for their efforts. Thank you. I know, I know this will seem backwards. Um, I like to move the bill as amended. Thank you. And I, I only I do that because he's going to leave in a minute, and so uh, there are a couple of folks that are leaving. I'm trying to, you know, hustle up votes. Thank if you, I chair. could, let me let the witnesses that you have testify. I'm going to hold his motion, but don't talk him out of it. <laughs> okay. We got the point. Go yes. John Lovell, and I'm here representing two clients, Bingo Innovations, which is a bingo management company, and also the California Narcotic Officers Association, which sees this as a tool that they can use for their Survivors Memorial Fund. And I'm here to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Kathy Lynch representing the California Association of Nonprofits. As the Senator has pointed out, many charities um, want to pursue remote caller bingo. There are many local ordinances that have been in place. Um, we've noted that school districts and others are very interested in this game as well. And we just want to let the committee know how much the charities want this activity and appreciate the work the legislature has done in the past on this. Thank yes, you. Sir. Dana Nickel, P. Conantine Associates, representing the American Legion in support. Many posts are waiting to use this valuable tool to help veterans. Thank you. I'm not aware of any. Is there opposition? Reverend Butler, welcome aboard. Thank you. Reverend, Reverend James Butler from the California Coalition Against Gambling Expansion. Very briefly, current law does allow remote caller bingo. And that current law includes some uniform standards, some safeguards, and some state supervision. These are deleted and challenged by the um, proposed bill. The state has provided an opportunity for remote caller bingo. And for whatever reasons, not many have sought it out. And now it seems as if we need to remove uh, regulation and oversight in order to accommodate that. Currently, all that are involved in um, operating remote caller bingo must be licensed by the state of California. This bill will remove that requirement. And as more and more of this is placed on the local entities, they may or may not do background checks, but they don't require the same licensing elements that are currently in place. Remote caller bingo is a little different than bingo in a local municipality where the ordinance may already be in existence in as much as it obviously will transcend that municipality. One can imagine that we will end up with a patchwork 
of standards and regulations and rules depending upon the city and or county that has implemented it. I have to say that I had some questions about the DOJ, but I guess that has already been addressed in part. Thank you. I do wonder though about the section, it's on page 23, that deals with the audits and it says that audits may be required, but audits are, at least the one that I had, said that it would be contingent upon the legislative um, appropriating funds for this purpose. And if, if that is the case, then in our financial climate, one can imagine that, that funding for that purpose will never be appropriated. And therefore, if the audit is contingent upon legislative appropriation, then there won't be an audit done. Audits may be submitted, but we won't have audits done by the state unless that is um, funded. I think that there are, are a lot of good things being done by charities. I think that this can be a funding source. We have various concerns, but the original bill went through, permitted this to occur. If we need to streamline a regulation, perhaps we can do that, but to remove the oversight and the supervision from the state, end up with a patchwork um, set of standards and regulations, I think we're just asking for trouble. And especially if funding is inadequate to provide the kind of supervision that this would necessitate, we may end up with remote caller bingo without a lot of oversight or regulation at all. So we oppose this, we're concerned about it. Unfortunately, it, it happened in such a quick and, and um, speedy fashion as this is uh, not a bill that I had previously, we followed SB 340, but this is um, SB 383, so it's, uh, this is what we've been able to discern at this point. But thank you for your time. If there's questions, I'm happy to address, but I know you're in a hurry. Um, Yes, ma'am. Mr. Chairman, um, Anna Carr with the Gambling Control Commission. I just wanted to note that the commission hasn't seen the amendments. We would likely have some concerns with them. We need to uh, take the opportunity to review them. We also did just release a report on the fundraising effectiveness of the remote caller bingo program. Um, overall, there are 18 organizations authorized to conduct remote caller bingo. There are currently only eight organizations conducting the game and these organizations have basically generated minimal uh, funds for charities. If there are any questions, please let me know. Well, let me ask you, where did the, you says minimal funds for charities, where did the money go? Well, there's a, a breakout of- and, um, I, and I have apologized, I've seen the report that you did, but I haven't read it, so I'm, I'm a little behind. There are, uh, there's a breakout for prizes, there's a, a breakout that can go uh, towards um, costs for the vendor. There, uh, there's a breakout for a repayment to the loan for the Indian Gaming Special Distribution Fund. So basically, um, you take the, the full 100% minus the 20 um, for the, uh, up to 20 for the vendor, 37% for the prizes, 5% for the SDF loan, and that leaves 38%. For the charities, basically, based on the, the last three quarters that we've received, the program generated gross receipts totaling about 181,000 for the first through third quarters. And if you take into consideration all these calculations, the charity should have received at least 69,000 uh, for uh, remote caller bingo. That's me, for them to use for me, charitable purposes. Let me, and I'm, I'm dragging this out, and I apologize. If 38% is what the charities received. What percentage would you have preferred they receive? That wasn't our decision. That was. Uh, I'm just saying, but I'm just saying, if, you, if your, your statement was 38% was minimal, so what would be optimal? Well, it wasn't the percentage, it was the amount of revenues generated was relatively but, minimal. But compared to what? Compared I mean, that's to all, that's the all, that's amount all we're of able money to do. that. You, okay, you're, you said that the charities received a minimal amount of money. Minimal compared to what? Minimal the based on what? expenditures for the program to date for uh, over, the, since the 
implementation of the program have been $402,000 to develop the program, develop the regulations, staff the program, oversee the program. It's been $402,000. Okay. So compare the $402,000 for the cost to regulate the program versus the $69,000 provided to the nonprofits. That's the comparison. That's basically what you're looking at. I thought the nonprofits received 180. That's the total receipts for remote caller bingo for three quarters totaled $181,000. But after you take all the calculations for prizes and uh, for uh, other expenses, okay. let me, let me, the let me charities. Do, let, me do, let me do something because we'll, we'll keep going around. At, at some point, a person puts a dollar in, right? Mm -hmm. And some percentage of that goes to the charity, right? So it, if, if, if the charity got 10 cents, then that means they got 10%. If they got a quarter, they got 25%. What percentage, I thought I heard you say that it was 38%. At least 38%. Okay. What percentage do you think should go to the charity? That's if you think 38% is low, then what percentage would you think would be fair? Well, that's all relative based on what sort of oversight. No, no it's not. You, you, you made the statement, so you should have an opinion. If you don't, that's fine. But then that means that your statement about a minimal return is bogus. Because if you don't have an opinion, then that's fine. Basically, it was just a comparison, Senator. Compared to what? Compared to the amount of regulatory expenses. Based on what? What, what is a fair number? If you're saying that the number's not fair, then that means you must have or you should have an opinion of what a fair number is. If you don't, then your other opinion is, has no merit. Either you think the number's good or it's bad. If it's bad, based on what? If you don't have an opinion, then take the other part back because that means you don't know what you're talking about. Either it's a good number or it's a bad number. If you pick the number, I'll take your number. You said 38% was not good. I asked you compared to what? You said you don't know. Fine, that means you don't know. So that means we're gonna go back to the bill then. If you don't know, that's fine, but you can't say this is minimal and it's not good. I ask you, what is a good number? You tell me, I don't know. Is four, if they did 40%, would that be good? Mr. Chair. Wait, hold on, is 40% is good? Is, would 43% be good? We don't have a recommendation on the percentage. Okay. Basically, then, then, what, what, then what basis do you make to say that 38% is minimal? Mr. Chair, yes. perhaps we can ask this witness to get the answer for you later. Um, I think oh, maybe okay. she might not have the answer for you, so maybe we'll give her an opportunity to get it to you later. Okay. But, um, Mr. Chairman, if I may, basically the other piece of this is the demand for the program and the participation in the program. Regardless of the percentage, if you have large participation in the program and large attendance in the program, that will, would generate more revenues and um, theoretically gets you closer to where you're covering the costs of the program. That was basically the, the concept here. Okay. Mr. Senator Wolk. Mr. Chair, if I could simply respond using the same uh, report that uh, was quoted. The conclusion of the report is that, and I quote, to the extent that the program can be restructured and streamlined as a locally regulated program similar to traditional bingo, which is what I'm proposing. This could provide an alternative for nonprofit organizations to continue the program in a more cost-effective manner. Having participated at the city of Dixon, which is a small community that has seen all of its funding for the schools for sports programs go away, and having been there that night when the schools were the recipient of whatever happened on that particular night, their programs are going to continue because of this program. What I'm trying to do is allow communities that wish to participate in this program. The Gambling Commission, I look forward to working with them. We have been trying to for the last two years. They have the authority to make, to be able to increase uh, their ability to respond to increased demand, but they have not been willing to do that. Instead, what they did was they cut off the pro entrance to the well, program. Well, These are wonderful programs. See, I guess, you know, when my daughter was in high school, um, she went to a school in Inglewood called St. Mary's. Mm -hmm. And if you were a parent at St. Mary's, then you had to work bingo night. <laughs> um, 
I spent, <laughs> yeah, I spent, so I spent three years on Wednesdays in the parking lot at St. Mary's. Good job. Come rain or shine, parking cars for the bingo night. Now, it was a remote caller, but it was bingo. And to your point, the, the bingo program financed much of the right. extracurricular activity at St. Mary's. Right. And as a, a parent, you had to work it for free as a part of your tuition component to, to do that. If it was a remote caller system, the only dynamic is that the game would have been perhaps at uh, St. Antonyms, and we would have been playing the game at St. Mary's, but the dynamic would have been the same. The concern that I would have is whether or not the game is fair and the people at St. Mary's were being cheated or vice versa. Correct. So the, the other concern would certainly be, again, in the case of St. Mary's, the, the, the labor was free because I didn't get paid. They just assumed that was a part of my tuition. And they manage the game themselves. As I'm looking at your bill, I'm not concerned about the fairness of the game. That seems to be well covered. One could make an argument, perhaps, that if, if Davis had a local ordinance that said that they did not allow bingo at all, and that someone were playing remote from Sacramento, that, that might be something where Davis City might have a protest, but that's not the case here. So I don't have a problem with it because I think that potentially it does. Because if you have a remote call system, it also lowers the cost because you don't have as many callers, you don't have to do the game as much. So on the economy of scale, it makes the game even more profitable. So we would go from 38% possibly to 45 or 50 percent. It's an exciting you, game. You, you do it's have to rent the hall and Bingo. I mean the, the thing that I used to notice and, and I'll shut up and if we can get a motion. I watched a lady who was about 70 years old who was able to play like 20 cards at one time and she had a, a red dauber and when you and when you said I whatever it was she could like punch like all those things that I mean, and it, it was it was amazing to watch her dexterity and being able to go through the game and get the, get the bingo done. I mean, I, I recognize Reverend Butler's concern that it's gambling, and gambling is is another thing. And we, I mean, we may agree or disagree about gambling, but I respect your your point about gambling. But again, I mean, those places where I've seen it done, it, it's you know, I mean, I would say probably a third of them are churches in my experience, that are actually involved in the game. Yes, sir, I'll, I'll, I'll defer back to you. And this may be a question of clarification, which as I read the bill that I had, uh, wasn't clear. It's very clear that wherever the remote caller is, that that entity has to have an ordinance for remote caller bingo. Mm -hmm. So if they're from Inglewood, right. if, they're, that's, if right. that's where the site is, that's, right. Right. My, that's where the caller is. Mm -hmm. My question is, do the other remote sites also have to have yes. that yes. same? Yes. But will they be the same ordinance? We still require. And the require, answer may not be the same. Okay. And so they may not. We right. require. We. I. I encourage you to read the bill. I've read. The bill. We well. I'll read it. We again. we have re required the same state oversight that currently exists in the program. We're just trying to get the program, get the barriers out of the prevention of getting this program going. I mean, but you also oh, removed oh. the model ordinance, which would have given a uniformity. And that oh, is the, the policy direction that, that, that okay. you don't, we don't eliminate state oversight, but we're trying to encourage more local participation. Let me go and to that. Senator Barry Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator, I want to, to back this bill. I want to vote for this bill. I do have some concerns and can, on the amendments because we haven't, they haven't gone across our desk and I just do have some concerns as, as we move forward, you know, as we do these bills kind of on the run. So if you could clarify those amendments for us a little bit, I would appreciate it. You should have seen the amendments. Your vice chair, uh, Senator Anderson did. Uh, as well as the chair. The, the direction of the bill was to uh, 
change the oversight mechanism to the Department of Justice. We're not going to do that because um, it's with the Gambling Commission. That's where it legally resides, and that's where it should stay. DOJ doesn't want it. Our interest in the bill from the day one has been to facilitate more groups being able to get the, get the barriers out of the way of this very, very positive, successful program. It ought to be used by more communities, by more veterans groups, by more school groups. Uh, it, is, um, uh, it is helpful to them. And we left it with the Gambling Commission. So it, forget the DOJ. Okay, That's thank, the difference. Thank you. Opposition, is there a, a, the pleasure of the committee? Well, I'm sorry. Well, we, we, we still have an, a, a little bit of an issue in that we, we, don't, we don't have those amendments in front of us. Okay. I apologize for that if that's the case. My understanding was that the chair and the vice chair had seen this change. Okay. Um, this, and, and I apologize, Senator Barry Hill, because I, I thought, I, I know Mr. Anderson, in fact, he was going to move the bill yeah. before he, yeah. before he yeah. left, so I know that he'd seen it. Well, we, did, we didn't take his motion because we couldn't have moved it and had uh -huh. the discussion, so that preempted that move. We will get him back to vote on it as soon as we do that. Thank you. We do have a motion from Senator Hernandez. Uh, the motion is do pass as to be amended. Uh, the DOJ portions and those things will be uh, uh, as, 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 a, as a deal mm -hmm. as amended. Yes. Okay. Call the roll. Motions do pass as amended to appropriations, right? Aye. Right aye. Anderson? Berryhill? Aye. Berryhill aye. Calderon? Canella? Corbett? Aye. Corbett aye. De Leon? Evans? Hernandez? Aye. Hernandez aye. Padilla? Strickland? Wyland? Yee? Aye. Yee aye. That's got five. That's got, that's got five. We need seven. It's on call. Thank uh, you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, members. I think, do we have anything else? Have, uh, oh. oh, this is your bill? Oh, man. This is the easy one. <laughs> it's, it's hard to believe that mine is the only bill that is non controversial. But. Can I take up um, SB uh, 118? Yes, Senator Yee has uh, our last and final bill, SB 118. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and uh, Senators. Uh, this is a. Um, just a tactical fix. Uh, the reality is that uh, right now, when the uh, state controller um, does work uh, on the um, geo bond, they get reimbursed. Uh, on revenue bond, they have to go to a conduit. What this bill will do is to take, th uh, take, take the conduit out, state treasurers out, and the uh, state controllers can, in fact, then get reimbursement for work that they do on revenue bond. With that urgent, I vote. Now, if the if the controller doesn't finish his work inside of a week, do we get to withhold the money that he would have been reimbursed? I'm sure you're going to watch can, that. Can, uh, can, we, can we take it out of his paycheck? <laughs> I'm sure that uh, okay. you'll watch oh, that very closely, oh, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, witnesses in support? Oh, hit your, your button, ma'am. Linda Lingbloom, representing the State Controller's Office, SB 118, is sponsored by our office. And as Senator Yee mentioned, this bill simply is a uh, fix to allow us to receive direct reimbursement authority on work that we are required by law to perform on all revenue bond and lease revenue bond sales and closings. Um, thank you for hearing and considering our bill this morning, and I respectfully ask for an I vote. Okay. It's been moved by Senator Berryhill. Let me ask first, though, before I take the motion, are there witnesses in opposition? Seeing none, we've got a motion from Senator Berryhill. Um, Secretary, open the roll. Motion is do pass and re-refer to appropriations, right? Aye. Right, aye. Anderson, Berryhill. Aye. Berryhill, aye. Calderon, Canella. Aye. Canella, aye. Corbett. Aye. Corbett, aye. De Leon, Evans, Hernandez. Aye. Hernandez, aye. Padilla, Strickland, Wyland. Ye, ye, I. That has six. It needs one more. Um, we're going to go back and open the roll on the bills that were on call. If you've already voted, you don't have to stay. Uh, if you haven't voted on some of the bills, if you're in, uh, I think I know we've got some people in as it natural resources. There are a couple of other committees. Uh, we're going to. Um, 
be getting out of here in about five minutes. So if you have some votes that you haven't done, uh, we're gonna be opening the calls. Um, let's see, we've got, we've got, we're gonna open the roll on the consent calendar first. Uh, the secretary open the roll, announce the vote, and we'll announce the, 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 the initial vote. Rather. Current vote is eight to zero on the consent calendar. Absent members Calderon, Canella, Canella I, Strickland, Wyland. That's nine to zero. Nine to zero, we'll hold that open for a while. Why don't we go to uh, Senator Wolk's 383, what's the current vote? Current vote is five to zero. Absent members Anderson, Calderon, Canella, Canella I, De Leon, Evans, Padilla, Strickland, Wyland. That's six to zero. Six currently. zero, we'll return that to call. We've got Padilla 778, open the roll. It's currently eight to zero. Absent members Calderon, Canella, Canella I, Evans, Strickland, Wyland. That's nine to zero. We'll, we'll open the, leave the roll open, we'll remain on call. Um, okay, we're gonna get a couple of other members in. We've got one bill that is still pending. Ms. Wolk, if we can get Mr. Anderson back, we'll work on that one. And we'll do it. Consent calendar is item one. The current vote is nine to zero. Absent members Calderon, Evans, aye. Evans I, Strickland, Wyland. That is ten to zero. Ten to zero. That bill is out. Open the roll on SB 118 Ye. Current vote is six to zero. Absent members Anderson, Calderon, De Leon, De Leon I, Evans, Evans I, Padilla. Padilla I, Strickland, Wyland. That's nine to zero currently. Nine to zero, we'll leave that on call. We'll go to SB 383, Senator Wolk's bill. Current vote is six to zero. Absent members Anderson, Calderon, De Leon, De Leon I, Evans, Evans I, Padilla. Padilla I, Strickland, Wyland. That is nine to zero currently. Nine zero, we'll leave that on call. We'll go to Senator Padilla's bill, uh, seven, seven, eight. Current vote is nine to zero. Absent members Calderon, Evans, Evans I, Strickland, Wyland. Ten to zero. Ten zero, that bill is out. We'll just leave the two for Anderson. We'll leave, yeah. Ooh, Senator Anderson will <laughs> open it up one more time. Um, forgot to wind you off. Why don't um, we do SB1? Um, 118, item two. Oh, yeah, we closed it. Item two, SB 118, ye. Current vote is nine to zero. Absent members, Anderson. Aye. Anderson, I. Calderon, Strickland, Wyland. That's 10 to zero. To, that bill is out. And Wolk. Senator Wolk's bill, SB 383. Is currently nine to zero. Absent members, Anderson. Aye. Anderson, I. Calderon, Strickland, Wyland. It's 10 to zero. That's out. We're adjourned. <laughs>